it is necessary to say just whom we regard as our antagonists, theologians and all who have any theological blood in their veins. This is our whole philosophy. Welcome to part 3 of our analysis on Nietzsche's The Antichrist, in which we will go over Nietzsche's attack on theology and those who think like theologians. The previous two parts are linked in the description. Strictly speaking, theology is the study of God, specifically in the context of this work, the Christian God. Every priest is a theologian, but not every theologian is a priest. Furthermore, Nietzsche's attacks are not limited to theologians proper, his attack is broader. Everyone with any theological blood in their veins is his target. Upon this theological instinct I make war. I find the tracks of it everywhere. Whoever has theological blood in his veins is shifty and dishonorable in all things. But what is Nietzsche's problem with theologians? And what does he mean exactly when he talks of the theological instinct? Chiefly, Nietzsche points out idealists as exemplars of those with theological instinct. The theological instinct is the tendency of philosophers and priests to look at reality with suspicion. A closer look at the passage from Twilight of the Idols will help us here. Philosophers place that which makes its appearance last. Unfortunately, for it ought not to appear at all. The highest concept, that is to say, the most general, the emptiest, the last cloudy streak of evaporating reality, at the beginning, as the beginning. This, again, is only their manner of expressing their veneration. The highest thing must not have grown out of the lowest, it must not have grown at all. The fundamental error of philosophers is that they cling to certain ideas. Ideas such as being, the absolute, the good, truth, and perfection. These are abstract concepts that, strictly speaking, do not exist in the material world as such. And because these philosophers have an instinctive hatred of reality, the most obvious sign of décadence, according to Nietzsche, they reason that these so-called high concepts cannot have arisen or evolved out of this material world. Their origin must lie elsewhere. Yet, these concepts also cannot stand in opposition to one another. They must all derive from yet another abstract concept, higher than all the rest, even further removed from earthly existence. Thus, they attain to their stupendous concept, God. The last, most attenuated and emptiest thing is postulated as the first thing, as the absolute cause, as en serialissimum, the most real thing. When Nietzsche speaks of the theological instinct in the Antichrist, he is referring to this mistake, postulating God as the first cause, as the ultimate reality. Nothing could be further from the truth, according to Nietzsche. The theologian flips metaphysics on its head. He puts first, the thing that should come last, or rather, the thing that should not have come at all. The idealist philosopher is also guilty of making this mistake. Arthur Schopenhauer and Immanuel Kant, for example, both have reasoned that not this world, but some other world, the will in Schopenhauer's case, and the thing in itself in Kant, is the ens realissimum, or the most real thing. But it is not just a metaphysical question. By flipping reality on its head, so to speak, the theologian also flips morality on its head. Wherever the influence of theologians is felt, there is a transvaluation of values, and the concepts true and false are forced to change places. Whatever is most damaging to life is there called true, and whatever exalts it, intensifies it, approves it, justifies it, and makes it triumphant is there called false. This is not surprising. The philosophical tradition, as far back as Plato, has equated metaphysics with ethics. If the world is a certain way, you must act a certain way. But what if the metaphysics are completely wrong? Well, then the ethics are also wrong. People erect a concept of morality, of virtue, of holiness upon this false view of all things. They ground good conscience upon faulty vision. They argue that no other sort of vision has any value anymore. Once they have made theirs sacrosanct with the names of God, salvation and eternity. I unearth this theological instinct in all directions. At this point in the Antichrist, Nietzsche begins an extended critique of Kant's moral philosophy. But we will not discuss this critique here. We'll make a separate video on the subject because it deserves its own in-depth discussion. If you want to be notified when this video comes out, please subscribe to the channel and click the bell button. 
The theological instinct against which Nietzsche declares war is of course best exemplified not in the philosophy of Kant or Schopenhauer, but in Christianity itself. Thus Nietzsche characterizes Christianity as being completely imaginary, making up imaginary causes which lead to imaginary effects. Under Christianity, neither morality nor religion has any point of contact with actuality. It offers purely imaginary causes – God, soul, ego, spirit, free will, or even unfree – and purely imaginary effects – sin, salvation, grace, punishment, forgiveness of sins. Intercourse between imaginary beings – God, spirits, souls – an imaginary natural history, anthropocentric – a total denial of the concept of natural causes. What this leads to is a distrust of the word nature. Once the concept of nature had been opposed to the concept of God, the word natural necessarily took on the meaning of abominable. The whole of that fictitious world has its sources in hatred of the natural, the real, and is no more than evidence of a profound uneasiness in the presence of reality. This explains everything. This is the breeding ground for décadence and ressentiment. We can see how this theological instinct is, for Nietzsche, the root of everything that is bad with the world. The theological instinct leads to bad metaphysics, which leads to bad ethics, which leads to a distrust of nature, which leads to a distrust of life, which leads to décadence, weakness and ressentiment. And the theological instinct finds expression in Kant and Schopenhauer, and with them, in the entire tradition of Western philosophy, but most of all, it finds expression in the religion of Christianity. And against this instinct, against this religion, Nietzsche will wage war and attempt to set the record straight. The rest of the Antichrist is nothing more than an elucidation of what was said up until this point. In what follows, Nietzsche will not really say anything new. Rather, he will make the case from a wide variety of perspectives historical, genealogical, theological, philosophical, that Christianity is opposed to life and nature. Nietzsche has said so himself in the previous quotation. This explains everything. But that doesn't mean that the rest of the Antichrist doesn't hold any value. Quite the opposite, in fact. This video was an exposition on Nietzsche's general critique of Christianity. In the coming parts, we will tackle his specific critiques of Christianity. If you want to be notified when these parts come out, please subscribe to the channel and click the bell button. And if you're enjoying this series, please like this video and leave a comment. It helps out the algorithm and the channel a great deal. If you want more Nietzsche, we have done an hour-long video on Nietzsche's genealogy of morals and also on Beyond Good and Evil. Thank you for watching and we'll see you in the next one.